Okay, it's 11.01. Let's get started. I don't want to delay lunch. Thank you. Thank you. And with Rick and me, you're seeing a real contrast. He's neurotypical. I'm neurotypical. I really struggle with when I'm hearing story. Hey, pass the story. I just want the content. So you're getting the opposite with me. But I am learning from Rick that when you're talking to neurotypical people, you need to build some stories in. So that's why I gave you some stories in the last talk. But it's something I'm really struggling with because I'm just a content guy. And I want to give you as much content in as short a time as possible. And so I realize that sometimes, as Rick says, when you listen to you, it's like drinking out of a fire hydrant because uh, it just pours out the content. But that's typical of people that are on the autistic spectrum. They're totally focused on content, and the more content, the better. And yeah, when people are doing a dance routine or they're singing songs or whatever, get me past all that. I just want the content. Okay, I want to take you back to Acts 15. Acts 15, we have the circumcision story, uh, where you have these Jewish Christians saying, hey, if you really want to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you have to be circumcised. And one of the problems with Paul and Barnabas, because they're leading all the Greeks to faith in Christ, they're not circumcised. And you've got these Jews saying, hey, if you want to be part of us, you've got to get circumcised. And it became such a contentious issue that they wound up going to the Jerusalem uh, Council and saying, hey, what are we going to do? And they had an open debate about it. And out came a short letter a letter that basically said, hey, let's not let this be a stumbling block uh, to these non-Jewish uh, believers. Let's open up a door. But notice, it took more than a generation for the controversy to subside. And if you're like me and a student of uh, Bible history and Christian history, what you notice is every generation of the church was confronted with a church-splitting issue that had nothing to do with salvation. Every church is confronted with an Acts 15 problem. I prefer to call it Acts 15 opportunity. And one of the things I've noticed in reading through the splitting controversies, number one, none of them any need salvation, and none of them are in the creeds of the church. They're not the essentials, and yet people deeply divide over it, and often they kill one another over it. You know, I was mentioning yesterday, there was actually a war that broke out in the Netherlands and Belgium over this issue of free will and predestination. You know, this happens. And every case where the church splitting issue comes up, basically targeting an unwelcome people group. I mean that the people that are within the church feel very uncomfortable with a people group coming into the church. And so they wind up coming up with a doctrine that ensures that people are kept out. So in the case of the century church, he had all these Jewish believers, and what did they do? Gentiles? They used the phrase they're dogs, they're pigs. Uh, uh, and yet, what we see uh, in the writings of the Apostle Paul, especially in the book of Ephesians, he talks about the mystery of the gospel. The mystery of the gospel that the angels are intently trying to understand is how power of the Holy Spirit. People groups that are at war with one another come to peace with one another. That's the mystery of the gospel. This is the beauty of the gospel that can come together and be fellowship with one another. I know friends that are missionaries in Israel and what they're doing for the first time are Muslims coming to faith in Christ, Jews coming to faith in Christ, and these two groups that are deeply divided are actually shipping with one another uh, in the Christian community. Now, what I want to address is a current church splitting issue. And I was naive. I was not raised in a Christian home. Uh, the first church I ever got involved in was a church that's near Caltech. And uh, that's the first time I ever met people that thought that the Bible, thought that the earth and the universe was young. That's the story I can tell. I was speaking on Genesis. And after I, with my message, I saw these 12 men coming towards me. And, uh, you know, I couldn't tell what was going on, but my wife is beside me and says, Hugh, they're very angry. And I says, oh, on what's going on? 
and they came up to me and said, how come you didn't teach the alternative interpretation of Genesis 1? I said, well, what interpretation are you talking about? The idea that the days are six consecutive 24 hours and the universe is only thousands of years old. And so I've been the first time I'm hearing about it. That got them even angrier. It's like, how can you say it? you've never heard of this? This is what the Bible teaches. Look, I'm being honest with you. This is the first time I've ever heard of this. And uh, you've got to tell me, how did you get this out of Genesis? I don't, just, don't, just don't see it. That was exposure to the young earth versus old earth debate. And at the time I thought, certainly this can't last more than two years. Uh, that was back in 1984. And it's like, it's around. Uh, I do think it is getting resolved, but it's getting resolved slowly uh, and gradually. So what I want to share with you is I found successful in bringing uh, these young earth creationists and old earth creationists together. You say, what is the unwelcome people group? I think I shared this with a few of you earlier. That this doctrine that the Bible teaches the universe is only thousands of years old and not billions of years old, it's basically targeting the STEM people. People that are in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine. Certain, by the way, this isn't universal. There's a reason for that. Um, but what you see is that people who have this long Christian tradition and then they see these scientists and engineers coming into the church, it causes a cultural battle. And I've seen this frequently. I, I may have already told you this story. How when I was... Uh, uh, you know, pastoring in this church not far from Caltech in the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I invited five of my bachelor physicist friends from Caltech to come to the church. And uh, so I brought them to the service. That was probably a mistake. I should have had them come to my class first, but they came to the service. And the pastor that morning was maybe three minutes into a sermon and all five of them stood up and they wanted to challenge him and say, I don't think what you're saying is right. Now, in most churches, they would have called for the ushers and ushered them out of the church. Fortunately, because of where we were, the pastor stopped his sermon and addressed their issue, satisfactorily answered their objections, and they sat down, and he continued on with the sermon. Those five came to my Sunday school class afterwards, and one of the five got super excited about the text we were studying. We're in the book of Titus ran all excitedly to the blackboard and filled it with all these equations. And he says, we can do uh, perturbative analysis on this Bible text. This is really exciting. And I turned to him and said, you actually think everybody here in this classroom understands perturbative analysis? Oh yeah, of course. I mean, this is easy math. Everybody understands this. So I said, well, let's do a survey. How many of you in the class actually understand all the equations here on the blackboard? The only hand that went up was mine, okay? Well, the other four, they put up their hands too. But the rest of them, no, we've never seen this before. So there's a culture barrier there. And that's how you resolve these church-splitting controversies. You need to understand. And, you know, when we train missionaries, what do we do? We train them in cross-cultural evangelism. Understand the culture. Don't go to the mission field until you understand the culture you're dealing with. All right. The culture I'm trying to deal with here are Christians into a young earth creationist position. How do I get them to understand this is not uh, a doctrinal issue that's essential for the Christian faith and actually begin to welcome these engineers and scientists into the church and realize these scientists and engineers are weird, they're strange, they like to challenge. But I'll tell you something else that happened that Sunday morning. We got a little further into the book of Titus. And by the way, all five of these uh, physicists were non-believers. It's the first time they'd ever been in a church. And so uh, we get on and a little further into the text in Titus. And one of them says, ah, we can interpret it this way. We can interpret it that way. We can interpret it that way. Tell you what, I'm going to defend this one. Why don't you defend that one? And then I said, yeah, this is good. Come up in front of the class. And so they did a debate in front of the class. 
But the people in our class were not used to the vigor with which scientists debate. They really went after one another. And so I stopped the debate and I told the class, what do you think these two are doing? And he said, they must despise one another. They must hate one another. The way they're going after one another really makes me feel uncomfortable. So I turned to the two physicists and said, what's going on? They said, hey, we're best friends. We do this all the time. And everybody was looking at them and just shaking their heads. I can't believe it. You mean this is the way you live your lives? They said, yeah, we do this every day. It's how we test things. It's how we learn things. This is actually fun for us to do. And by the way, neither of us believes in the interpretation that we're defending. So that's how we do our science. We defend things we don't believe in just to see if we can rule it out. And so, that, so I was trying to help the class understand this. And eventually they got to the point where they said, you know, this is good for us to practice in church. Let's get these people coming forward. And by the way, two of the five did become Christians. Okay. When you're dealing with people within the church that are locked into this younger view, they basically think this is a battle between the Bible and between man's fallen notions of science. They're basically not accepting the two books doctrine I've been teaching here, that God reveals himself faithfully in a trustworthy way through two books, the book of nature and the book of scripture. But here's the problem. You've got people in the church that are looking at the Bible and looking at nature, but they don't see it as nature, they see it as science. Science is not the same as the book of nature. Science is our interpretation of the book of nature. Likewise, theology is not the same as the Bible. It's our interpretation of the Bible. So there's every opportunity for theology and science to contradict one another. But there's no possibility for the book of nature ever to contradict the book of scripture. Both are from the same God, possible to lie or deceive. But the problem is this. The STEM people have very high confidence in the book of nature. But if they're not yet a believer, they have doubts about the book of scripture. Likewise, people have been raised raised in a young earth context, have a very high view of the Bible, but they have tremendous distrust of the book of nature and of science. And they actually believe that what's happening in science, the vast majority of them are atheists, they're out to deceive the public. Which means if you're going to engage people within the church, you can't lead with the book of nature. You have to lead with the book of scripture. And incidentally, if you're dealing with STEM people, you've got to with the book of nature. You don't want to lead with the book of scripture. It's a principle that applies to whatever audience you're addressing. Reach them with what they trust first. You can get to the other uh, revelations, but that comes after. You need to lead with the revelation they trust. And so what I find within Young Earth Creation, and by the way, I've done a lot of debates and speaking in front of audiences, that uh, one that's up on the web that you can watch, is where I did a debate in front of 1,200 young earth creationists. There wasn't a single old earth creationist there except for my wife. All the rest of them were young earth uh, creationists. Uh, and what was interesting was uh, they kept me in a green room uh, with the gentleman I was going to be debating. And they wound up brought him out and they left me in the green room. And I was in the green room for 45 minutes. And it's like, hey, this debate's supposed to be starting. How come I'm stuck in the green room? And then eventually they brought me out. My wife later told me what happened during those 45 minutes. Namely, that some theologians got up and said, we want to prep you for this debate uh, between Hugh Ross and Danny Faulkner. And what you're going to see is Hugh Ross is going to give you nothing but science. And what you're going to get from our guy is nothing but the Bible. What you're going to see is that Hugh Ross trusts science, but he doesn't trust the Bible. Our guy is skeptical about science, but he trusts the Bible. Well, I didn't know any of this. But I walked out, and uh, I was supposed to speak second, but uh, my uh, uh, opposing partner, he couldn't get his computer to work, so I spoke first. And what stunned the audience, I only gave Bible, no science. And uh, when the younger creations got up, 
all he gave was science and no Bible. It was exactly the opposite of what they'd been prepped for. But I knew the audience. I knew they wouldn't be able to trust any of the science, but they would trust the Bible. I also realized they probably hadn't gone through the entire Bible on this issue. So I basically said, I began my talk by saying, not all the answers are in Genesis. That was probably a mistake. Uh, I wasn't even aware there was an organization called Answers in Genesis, okay? <laughs> so, but my whole point was, if you're going to resolve this issue, you've got to look at all 66 books. Okay, with that as an introduction, let me launch into this. And by the way, this is just a quick survey of what the Bible's got to say on this issue bit of what I did in the debate. What does the Bible say about the age of the earth and the universe? And I always like to be in the debate by saying, well, what do we both agree on? Now, it's interesting, when it comes to the young earth and the old earth, both sides agree that all humans are descended from Adam and Eve, whom God specially created only tens of thousands of years ago, or thousands of years ago. I did that on purpose. What I hear from the Young Earth Creations community, if you're old Earth, you believe that humans have been around millions of years and that humans are the product of naturalistic evolution. So I explicitly said, I don't know of a single old Earth creation that holds that view. They all believe that all humans are descended from one man and one woman, Adam and Eve, who are not a product of naturalistic evolution. They're and we're talking not millions of years ago, you might think, I might say tens of thousands, but hey, it's only a factor of 10 difference. That's really not a big deal. So there's agreement there. There's also agreement that when we come to the Hebrew word, the word yom, both young earth creationists and old earth creationists agree that the word has four distinct literal definitions. So I basically said the debate you're going to be hearing today is between one literal interpretation of the Bible and a distinctly different literal interpretation of the Bible. It's not a debate between a literal and a figurative interpretation. It's a debate between two different interpretations. That was important because the word that goes out, if you're older, if you're not taking the Bible literally. No, the Hebrew word yom has four distinct literal definitions. I also reminded the audience, I've traveled around the world. This is predominantly an English language debate. When I go to France, this is not a debate at all. Here's the difference. Okay, the French vocabulary size is 40,000 words. Biblical Hebrew, the vocabulary size is 3,000 words. In both cases, I'm not counting the names of people in cities. It's basically uh, fundamental words. English, by contrast, has a vocabulary size over 4 million words. Now, there's two other places where there's young earth, old earth debate in the world is really uh, uh, active, and that would be in Japan and Korea. But in both Japanese, Japanese is a language of half a million vocabulary word size. Korean, likewise, has got a half million words. So you've got the challenge of taking a very tiny vocabulary language, maybe a biblical Hebrew, of only a few thousand words, and translating it into a language where you've got millions of words or hundreds of words. And so when you've got a vocabulary that tiny, it's essential that the nouns have multiple literal definitions. So you see this in the French language, you see this in the Biblical Hebrew <coughs> language, you see it in all small vocabulary languages. Whereas if you're an English speaker, not only do words take on a single distinct definition, each word has what, about 10 or 12 different synonyms you can choose. For example, if you want to about somebody that is thin, and some language is the only word you can use. In English, you can say, well, slender, slim, brawny, uh, emaciated. Those are all words the same thing. But the advantage is, notice you can put a little bit of an emotional context on what you think about the person who is, quote, uh, thin. But you can't do that in Biblical Hebrew. You can't do that in French. You only got the one word uh, in the cases. Normally does the word yom have part of the daylight hours, all a 24-hour period, or a long but period of time. It's the word 
in biblical Hebrew, you can do period of time. There is a word for year, but it's just one. Uh, if you want a long, unspecified, by finite period of time, you only got one option. You can only use the word yom. There is no other option. Now, the other thing that's a misnomer is this idea that young earth creationists and old earth creationists divide over the doctrine of sola scriptura. They don't. The doctrine of sola scriptura says the Bible is the only verbal, propositional, authoritative revelation. The problem is in the 21st century, a takes on a broader definition than it did when the doctrine of sola scriptura was developed in the Reformation. During the Reformation, when they used the word authority, it was understood authority can be manifested in a person. The word has a So uh, these equations I have in my t-shirt is having authority. But that would not be the case uh, during the Reformation. So old earth creationists fully accept that the Bible indeed is the only verbal, propositional, authoritative revelation because the book of nature is not a person. But it doesn't, sola scriptura, and by the way, you can study this doctrine, the reformers understood that the book of nature was trustworthy and reliable. But it wasn't verbal, it wasn't authoritative, and it wasn't propositional. Yes? Sorry, I missed that. What is the book of nature? The book of nature is uh, what you see in Psalm 19, that heavens declare the glory of God. Psalm 97 6, the heavens declare the righteousness of God. And Psalm 19 goes on to say uh, that God has written his words upon the universe for all of us to read. What you see in Romans chapter 1, we're all without excuse before God because God has clearly revealed himself and his attributes through the creation. Uh, but I look at the record of nature as distinct from science. Science is the best human attempt to interpret what's being revealed in the book of nature. And so, we humans do not have the pure word of God. We do not have the pure book of nature. What we have is interpretations of the book of nature and interpretations of the book of scripture. So we shouldn't be surprised that there's conflicts between how people interpret the book of nature and the book of scripture. By the way, you've got Paul saying that these kinds of divisions are good for the body of Christ. If we're not talking about our differences and interpretations, we're not going to learn anything. And so it's important that we permit dialogue, debate, discussions, and division. Okay. Only persons can wield authority. So this sola scriptura is not saying the book of nature is unreliable. It's simply saying it's not verbal, it's not propositional that doesn't have uh, authority in the sense that it rests in a person. The Belgic Confession, which comes out at the same generation that Sola Scriptura was developed, uh, this is the second longest of the confessional uh, creeds that we see in the, the Christian community. And in Article 2, it says, we know him, God, by two means. This addresses your issue. Two means, first by the creation, preservation and government of the universe since that universe is before our eyes like a beautiful book in which all creatures great and small are as letters to make us ponder the invisible things of God. They're not literal letters but they act like letters, sentences and paragraphs. Secondly, he makes himself more clearly and fully known to us by his holy and divine uh, word. And I'll go quickly through this, but this is crucial. The Bible teaches that the laws of physics do not change. Uh, often where they think it's changed is with, because you look at Genesis 3, where they say, cursed is the ground because of you. And people often interpret this text as saying that God changed the laws of physics and the ground today. The text is saying it's different because of you. It's different because you're now a sinner. And because you're a sinner, the ground will not produce like it would because you'll be abusing the ground. It'll be less productive. And these are the multiple texts in the Bible that declare for us different, and incidentally, it's important if you're going to hang on to a biblical doctrine, make sure you 
author uh, backing it up. 39 different authors of the 66 books of the Bible. And so if you can get two or three authors saying the same thing, you probably have got interpretation. But these are seven different texts that speak the fixity or the constancy of the laws of physics. For you, Jeremiah 33 is a text where God addresses all the time. I don't change. As proof, look at the laws that govern the heavens and the earth. As they don't change, I don't change. Now, from a scientific perspective, what we notice is Genesis teaches that stars and the sun were shining uh, before Adam fell. They were shining uh, after Adam fell. And so we got stars shining both before and after. Now, the distinction here is, and you can get this from anybody who's in a STEM career, stars are extremely sensitive to even the tiniest changes in laws of physics. Change the laws of physics by one part in a trillion, 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 and stars will no longer be able to shine for a long period of time. The other thing we notice is we got and Eve eating uh, before the fall, and the animals are eating before the fall, the animals are eating after the fall. The process of eating is like stars, extremely sensitive to even the tiniest changes in the laws of physics. What's the conclusion? The Bible actually rules out the young earth doctrine that God radically altered the laws and constants of physics at the fall and the flood. Now, I've studied all the young earth creationist interpretations of the Bible. A hundred percent of them depend on the laws of physics being radically changed at the fall of Adam and the fall and the flood of Noah. Say, how radical? The fall of Adam, they need the laws of physics to be changed by a factor of a million times. For Noah, it's a billion times. Reason why you need another factor of a thousand happens in just a short period of time. And this is actually admitted in the Young Earth Creations literature, probably most explicitly in the state study, uh, where different Young Earth Creations organizations came together and they said, scientifically, how can we work it out as so that the Earth and the universe are only thousands of years old, billions of years old, and they came to a consensus. The only possible way is if the laws of physics are altered by a million times at the fall and at the flood. And uh, they state, if there is no change in the laws of physics, then the Earth and the universe must be billions of years old. I counted seven times in the rate book where it made that statement. So on that basis alone, just based on what the Bible says about the laws of physics, we could actually settle this debate. Now, how long is God's rest? And what does he rest from? And here are the principles you want to integrate all the biblical creation texts. And you do have a lot of these creation texts in the book of Genesis. Five of them are in the book of Genesis. But it's not just the book of Genesis. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Corinthians, uh, Revelation, Ecclesiastes, Isaiah, uh, speak about creation. And so we have at least 27 chapter length or longer texts that deal with the subject of creation. So if you want to get a correct interpretation, it needs to be considered in the Bible. And every creation text is written in a literal context. So we're not dealing with figures of speech. And so we need to look at them say, interpreting them literally and consistently, what interpretations. And what we notice is you have a beginning and an ending for the first six days of creation. As you go through the six days of creation, for the first six days, they're closed out with was day three, day four, day five. And it's basically stating each of these days is a definite start time and a definite end time. I remember reading the Bible for the first time at age 17, and I anticipated that there will also be an evening and a morning for the seventh day. When you look at the seventh day, there is no evening morning phrase. And I think part of what's driving this controversy is the fact that the chapter division took place in the wrong place. The chapter division ends at Genesis 1.31. They should have divided the chapter at Genesis 2.4.
because you get a completely different message from Genesis 2, 5 forward. Genesis 1 uh, through 4 really belongs with Genesis 1. But hey, the decisions in the Bible were arbitrary. That's not part of the uh, scripture. Uh, there really wasn't any punctuation in the original Hebrew. Uh, no paragraphs and uh, no chapter divisions. There were no verses. But what it does tell us is that God rested after he created Eve. For six days he created. On the last of his creation acts is when he creates Eve. After he creates Eve, he stops creating. But as it tells us in John chapter 5, Jesus says, my father and I are still at work, which means we can do things on the Sabbath. We can't create on the Sabbath, but we can redeem on the Sabbath. And so he was able to perform miracles uh, that are in context with redemption, in spite of the fact that he was obeying the Sabbath of resting. He's resting from his creation work. And what you see in Psalm 95, it says, So oh God declared unto the mighty, they shall never enter into my rest, referring to his seventh day. But notice, it's in the present context. And so it's not a past event, it's an ongoing event. And Hebrews 4, Likewise, cites 95, Psalm 95, but it goes into more detail. On the seventh day, God rested from all his work. Anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. So the exhortation in Hebrews 4 is we're to live our lives in such a way that we can enter into God's seventh day, which means the seventh Day is continuing to exist. It also implies that when we study the book of nature, all we're going to find in the human era are natural processes. And as I mentioned previously, any scientist who focuses his research or her research in the human era will see zero evidence for God's miraculous interventions. For the simple reason, God has chosen to rest during the human era. And so, if you're wondering why your biology professor says, we see no evidence in science for any miraculous intervention, it's because he or she is seeing science during the human era. It also explains why so many are believers. Because an astronomy data uh, comes from the past, comes from previous to the human era. Or why so many paleontologists, as I mentioned yesterday, are acknowledging that naturalism in the history of life. And they see the evidence. Scientific evidence for God's creation miracles not the present year. They'll be limited to the not the seventh day. And as I mentioned yesterday, answers the fossil record enigma. I spent a lot of time on that. I'm just going to skip over that. The seventh day will end. God's rest is not eternal. The moment that God permanently eradicates all evil from his creation, the moment that the full number of humans that God intends to redeem have been redeemed, uh, that's when the seventh day will end. An eighth day is coming when he'll create again. You can read all about it in Revelation 21 and 22, the new creation. And what you see, in, and I describe this in detail in both Beyond the Cosmos and why the universe uh, is the way it is, that when you get to the new creation, you have completely different laws of physics, completely different dimensions, because the dimensions and the laws of physics of this universe were designed to be tools in God's hands for the eradication of all evil and suffering. Suffering no longer exists. There's no need for gravity. There's no need for or the strong and weak nuclear force or the dimensions of length, width, height, and time. And the point here is, if creation day seven is a long period of time, then Genesis 1's grammatical structure requires likewise the first six days must be long periods of time. And in Genesis 2.4, it actually uses the word day to describe the entirety of creation. Now what affirms this is what we see about creation day six. Genesis 1 tells us, that after God created the advanced land mammals, 
the three categories I talked about last night, then he creates both the human male and the human female. Both of them are created on day six. But you get an expansion on that in Genesis chapter two. And Genesis chapter two goes into details about what happens on day six, or at the very end of day six, after he creates all these uh, advanced mammals. He makes the point uh, that Adam is created outside of Eden. So Adam gets to see what life is like outside the Garden of Eden. If you want to know why we see a distinction between Adam and Eve, all Eve sees is the Garden of Eden. Adam was created outside the Garden. So he saw what life was like outside the Garden of Eden. But then God places him in the Garden of Eden. And once he's in the Garden of Eden, he observes the trees of the Garden of Eden growing. And you can imagine it takes some time to observe the growth of trees, just like it does around here. Trees here in Kauai grow very fast. But it takes a few days for you to notice that there's significant growth. The third thing he does is he tends a garden. And what God is doing in Genesis chapter 2, is Adam to the three creates of Genesis 1. So I mentioned last night, the word bara, to create brand new, it did not exist before, shows up just three times in Genesis 1. First for the physical universe, second for the soulish animals, and last of all, it uses the word create for the spirit beings, we human beings that he creates. He says, I'm first going to introduce you to the physical creation. So he says, I want you to a beautiful garden. But he says, this is a garden that's being subjected to the second law of thermodynamics. Also being subjected to electromagnetic radiation and gravity. So this garden is going to need to be tended. And so Adam works the garden. And he realizes this is a beautiful garden. He has a lot of enjoyment in tending the garden that God had planted and designed. And gets great fulfillment from it. But he also realizes there's something missing. Because Adam is body, soul, and spirit. He gets this physical fulfillment, but realizes something is missing. And so God says, yes, something is missing. There's also all these soulish animals. And he says to Adam, I've designed each of these soulish animals to relate to you in a distinct way. Last night I kind of talked about how that's brought out in the book of Job. And he says, I want you to relate to each of these animals and discover the way I've designed them to relate to you and I want you to give them an appropriate name. And so Adam took the time to examine each of these animals, understand how God designed them to please him and serve him, and give them an appropriate name. And then uh, God looks down on Adam and says, this man is lonely. And this may explain why God created Adam first. Uh, you know, women, typically feel lonely within a short period of time. Uh, you ladies here, it takes men longer before they notice that they're lonely. Some men, it actually takes several weeks or months before they know that they're lonely. Uh, but God observes that Adam is lonely. And so what does he do? He puts them under anesthesia. He performs surgery on them. And we have Adam recovering from the surgery. And he gets to see the result of his surgery. He gets to see this woman that, like him, spirit. So he sees Eve, and the word that comes out of his mouth wasn't that word. The word that comes out of his mouth in the Hebrew is the word hapa'am. It's used 20 more times in the Old Testament. at long. Exclaimed that like me as body, soul, and spirit. And the principle here is, if creation day six is much longer than 24 hours, then the Genesis one grammatical structure requires that all seven creation days likewise be longer than 24 hours. Now I do want to emphasize, these days are contiguous. We don't have gaps between the days. So right after the completion of day one, day two begins. Granted, the completion of day two, day three begins. It's six consecutive, finite, long periods of time. Now, do any Bible authors directly comment 
on Earth's antiquity? Actually, quite a few do. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. Here's one from Genesis 49, uh, where Jacob is speaking, your father's blessings are greater than the blessings of the ancient mountains, than the bounty of the age old hills. And so, for example, we can look at these mountains and rocks that are piled up at the bottom of the mountain. Now, these are in the Indian Rockies. If you go to the Judean mountains, about one rock falls off the mountain every week. In these mountains, you get about two rocks a day falling off it. So you get a much bigger pile of rubble at the bottom. But you look at all that rubble. And by the way, scientists have gone there uh, and looked at the rubble pile, estimated the quantity of, of boulders and rocks there, and they actually come up with an estimate for the age of these mountains that's very close to the radiometric date. And this is about a quarter of a billion years that these mountains have been around in order to generate that pile of and gravel and rocks at the bottom. And then this is Bible scholars for thousands of years. What's different is not until the 20th century did the debate become contentious. If you go all the way back to the early church fathers, they discussed this issue. Is the earth old or is it young? Uh, but there's none of the contention uh, or the attacks or the name calling that you see in the 20th and 21st century. They all recognize this as not a salvation issue, but they saw it as an interesting problem. And they saw it as a minor problem. So for example, thousand pages of commentary on Genesis 1. They probably wrote a lot more. Those are the 2,000 pages that survived to the modern era. But of those 2,000 pages, Less than two pages total deal with the age of the earth. Because these early church fathers recognize in looking at Genesis, the key message is the answer message is how completely trivial issue is when he creates. It's two pages total. Uh, but probably the one that commented on it most extensively was Augustine. This is what he said in the City of God. What kind of days these are is difficult or even impossible for us to imagine to say nothing of describing it. And so the early church fathers basically saw this as a problem that's unsolved and recognized it would be for a future generation to get illumination on it. Now the first Bible scholar that made explicit statements about how long these creation days were uh, was Isaac Newton. And this is what Isaac Newton said in a letter he wrote to the king's chaplain. He says, Now for ye number and length of ye six days, by what is said above, you may make ye first day as long as you please, and ye second day too. So he was the first public figure to take an unambiguous stand on the age of the universe, the age of the earth. And this is important because young earth creationists try to put all the blame on Charles Darwin. Isaac Newton said this 180 years before Charles Darwin announced his theory as evolution. Evolution wasn't an issue. Now normally, as much biblical evidence uh, for a universe that's billions of years old as opposed to thousands of years old would completely But what I've learned in my many debates with young earth creationists is the age of the earth is not the big issue. The really big issue is death before Adam. That's the issue uh, that they think is important. And I've run into a lot of young earth creations after I debate them a private conversation and basically say, I'm okay with an earth and a universe billions of years old, but I'm not okay with physical death before Adam. And so the physical death, not the universe's age, is the real issue dividing young from old creations. And basically they're saying, if the earth life has been here for billions of years and if life has been here for billions of years that means we've got plants and animals dying for billions of years old and they basically say we think that contradicts an all-powerful all-loving God. Well there's only two Bible passages that address the kind of death Adam introduced to any sin. So this is the big dividing part. Young earth creations believe that all forms of death were introduced when Adam sinned. 
old earth creationists take the view it was human death that was introduced that the Bible is silent on the death of plants and animals. Romans 5.12 and 1 Corinthians 15 explicitly and repeatedly attribute human death, not the death of plants and animals, to Adam's sin. Romans 5.12, sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sin the more latest translations will say death came to all people. The Greek word doesn't really distinguish uh, between uh, the sexes. Notice that Paul here is making two qualifications. The death that Adam introduced is death through sin. Only one species of life is capable of experiencing sin, we human beings. None of the other plants or animals are able to experience sin. So death through sin, and he says, Death came to all people. If you imply this is the first time plants and animals died, this text would read, Death came to all life. But that's not how it's written. Death came to all people. And so Paul is being very careful to exclude all non-human uh, life forms in this statement. And you get the same statement in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 22. It's explicit. Uh, to human beings. Uh, there is no reference to other plants and animals. And as I mentioned yesterday, if there's no plants and animals and microbes before Adam's sin, there'd be no biodeposits in the crust of the earth. There'd be no oil, no natural gas, no coal, no limestone, no marble, no concentrated metals. Now, how do young earth creatures respond to this? They basically say, well, we believe that before the flood, solar energy was being perfectly uh, transfused into coal, oil, and natural gas. Uh, but that would violate the second law of thermodynamics. You're not going to get 100% energy transmission. And even if you do, it would still take tens of millions of years, even with 100% conversion of solar energy into coal, oil, and natural gas, to come up with all the coal, oil, and natural gas. There's just way too much of it in the crust of the Earth uh, to fit into uh, any uh, young Earth model. But what I get, I've debated Ken Ham several times, and every time he tries to make it a salvation issue, basically saying, if you take an old Earth view, it destroys the basis of the gospel message and the message of redemption. He purposely uses his language, assuming listening to it, the Christians listening to it, will not actually see exactly what he's referring to. What he's referring to is, if we do have blood being shed of animals before Adam's sin, that destroys the doctrine of the atonement. And when I get a chance, Ken loves to interrupt me, so I don't always get to say what I want to say, uh, but what you do see in Hebrews chapter 10, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Only the blood of Christ redeems. The blood of bulls and goats are simply a symbol of the blood. And therefore, uh, taking an old earth perspective in no way damages the doctrine of the atonement. It's not a issue. And what I've discovered is, teaching young earth creationists who agree with me, this is not a salvation issue, we quickly resolve our differences. Where they think it's a salvation issue, we never resolve our differences. I appreciate that. A, a Christian is ever going to give up the doctrine of salvation uh, through the work of Christ on the cross. Now, only at Genesis creation days or long time periods can one hold that all 27 chapter length creation texts can be read both literally and uh, consistently. Probably you see this demonstrated. I participated in a book called four views on creation, evolution, and intelligent design. The four authors, I was one of the authors, Ken Ham was the one defending the young earth position, Deborah Hart, uh, evolutionary creationism slash theistic evolution, and then there was Stephen Meyer from the Discovery Institute. I didn't mean to block your view there. So, but what was interesting is all four authors, when they wrote their initial piece, 
said they believed in the doctrine of biblical inerrancy. However, in my response, I said, how do you define biblical inerrancy? Do you actually accept the doctrine of biblical inerrancy as defined by the International Council of Biblical Inerrancy? I was the only one of the four authors that did. The other three said, no, we can't accept it the way it's defined by the International Council of Biblical Inerrancy, which is why I make the claim biblical inerrancy is only defensible from an old earth perspective. If you take a young earth perspective, you've got different books of the Bible contradicting one another. Now, this is a quick summary. If you want to read a 400-page book where I go into this in exhaustive detail, A Matter of Days, the second edition, and again, you can get a free chapter by going to read. If you want to see a lengthy debate on this, this was actually done on the John Edward television show uh, where uh, we tried to model the Jerusalem Council. And so the astronomer Danny Faulkner and I debated uh, for two hours in front of television cameras. But we had agreed upon panel of people that would act like the elders of the Jerusalem church. Thirteen uh, Bible-believing evangelical astronomers sat there, watched the whole debate, and then we challenged those astronomers, come up with a statement like the Jerusalem Council and how you think we need to proceed. While being astronomers, they produced a 41-page statement that did not include all the end notes to the scientific and biblical literature. I said, you know, the Jerusalem Council reduced it to two sentences. See if you can take your 41 pages, eliminate all the footnotes and end notes, and get it down to one page. And they wrestled with this. It took them more than a year to be able to condense it down to one page. But it's a beautiful statement, and it's written in the spirit of what you see in Acts chapter short letter from the Jerusalem Council. It's posted on our website. All you need to do is say astronomer statement. It'll pop right up. And in my opinion, it really ma matches the tone of what we see from the Jerusalem Council. And again, there's many debates you can watch. Uh, this is another one I did on a television show. Uh, they call it the Great Debate. This is one where we also involved the Hebrew scholar, uh, Walt Kaiser, in the debate. I'll stop there and take questions. And again, it doesn't have to be on this issue. Yes? So whenever you talk about the death and like how animals and plants have been dying beforehand, um, in Romans 5, 12, where it refers to men dying, right. Oh, you're making a good point. If you look at Romans 5 through 8, Paul is addressing four different kinds of death. So it's spiritual death. Animals and plants do not die spiritually. They're not creatures. So that doesn't apply to them. So the fact that it mentions spiritual death tells us this is to human beings. But Romans 5.12 is talking about both. So when Adam sinned, God told him, in the day that you eat of that fruit, you will die. He didn't die physically, but he immediately died spiritually. Spiritual death came first. What Paul is saying is because of that spiritual death, physical death had to follow. And if you want the details, go to Genesis 3.22. Here is Adam and Eve in a spiritually dead state, but they still had access to the tree of life. And so they had the potential to be eternally spiritually dead and eternally physically alive. And God said, we can't let that happen. So he sent two angels with fiery swords to block access to the tree of life. Because God's plan all along was to use physical death as a tool to deliver humanity from the far worse consequence of spiritual death. So for example, with the demons, their fall was permanent. With humans, our fall was temporary because God had the tool of physical death to deliver us from spiritual death. So in a couple of debates I've had with young earth creationist theologians, I said, here is where I think we really differ. You think death is bad in all contexts. I believe that death is good in some contexts. After all, God sent his own son to die so that we could be delivered uh, from spiritual death. 
So, and incidentally, notice that God shortened the human lifespans. There was a time where we could live nearly a thousand years. Now our maximum lifespan is 120. And actually, that's a good thing. The fact that we live a shorter life means that there's now a greater restraint on serial killers. And so we're not going to run into the problem we had in the days before the flood, where people lived too long. And so just simply explaining to people, in some biblical context, physical death is a good thing, it's not a bad thing. The problem is, whenever you watch someone physically die, it's not a comfortable experience. So, although, what I shared with my parents when they were close to death is, it's Psalm 23. Because uh, my dad asked me, he says, son, what's, because he had six weeks to live, so what's it like to die? And I said, well, your body will begin to shut down, and you're going to feel confused, because your organs are going to shut down, the brain is going to shut down, the body will stop trying to keep itself alive, you're going to feel confused. That means you've got about a week to go. And then about two or days to go, or one day to go, you're going to feel great. Uh, you're going to think you're going to recover. And it's basically the body giving up the attempt to retain internal heat. And you'll be feeling too warm. You're going to want to turn the air conditioner on. Your brain's going to be functioning really well. You're th going to think you're getting better. No, that's your signal you've got about a day or two left. And then you'll hear your name being called. When you hear your name being called, Jesus will give you a personal thresh uh, escort across the threshold of this life to the next life. And so I've seen many people who are lucid at the time of their death, who are believers. That was the happiest moment, realizing they were being escorted into the next life by Jesus Christ himself. And he said, well, son, tell me what it's like for unbelievers. And I said, well, one of our pastors has been with people, over 300 people who were lucid at the time of death. For the unbelievers, they're screaming and yelling uh, vicious slanders at the person of Jesus Christ when they die and they're excited about being sent to hell. They want to go to hell. And so it's like night and day difference. The Christians are excited about the threshold and they say, I got to say goodbye. He's telling me it's time. They hear their name being called. So my whole point is death is not always a bad thing. It's a good thing. Yes. So I had two quick questions. One, do you, is, do you know of any astronomers that are younger creationists or no? I do. Uh, I know of two. Uh, one is Danny Faulkner. I've debated him twice. Uh, the other one is um, Jason Lyle. I think I've debated him four times. Those are the only two I know of. Um, and both of them are presuppositionalists, which basically means we don't care about the scientific evidence. We only care about our interpretation of scripture. And as I debated both of them, neither one of them are willing to acknowledge that my interpretation of the Bible is a valid interpretation. And in other debates I've had with people from the Institute of Creation Research, I run into this. Well, Hugh, you're interpreting the Bible. We're reading the pure word of God. I've been unable to try to persuade them. Their reading is an interpretation, just like my reading is an interpretation. But if yeah, they perceive it as a battle between the pure word of God and an interpretation, they always win. After all, how can you argue against the pure word of God? But my whole point is, no human being has the pure word of God. We all have an interpretation of the pure word of God. Sure, and that actually leads into my question. Do you believe that your theory could be incorrect? A good example of that, you can watch a debate between me and the atheist British chemist, Peter Atkins. Uh, it's gotten 400,000 views on YouTube. And for a whole hour, uh, Peter is yelling out his insults. Uh, all Christians are ignorant, they're stupid, they're foolish. Uh, all Christians are simply believing the religion of their parents. He refused to believe that I was raised in a non-Christian home. He says, that doesn't happen. All Christians are raised in Christ. They're just simply following the faith of their He kept saying, you have to base your faith on uh, evidence. And he says, that's the problem with 
you, Hugh, you're not looking at the evidence. Well, I kept putting out evidences. He never put out any for his atheism during the entire hour. A point was raised where the moderator said, Hugh, tell us some scientific evidences that would cause you to leave your Christian faith and join Peter Atkins as an atheist. I said, yeah, I can name several. If we can prove that the universe didn't have a beginning, that would be catastrophic to my Christian faith. If you can prove to me that we humans are not exceptional amongst all animals on the face of the earth, that would be catastrophic to my Christian faith. If you can prove to me that the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth never happened, that would be catastrophic to my Christian faith. And the moderator said, do you have more? I said, yeah, I got a lot more. He said, that's enough. He turned to Peter and said, what would it take you to abandon your atheism and uh, become a Christian? He said, well, I suppose if Jesus were actually to appear in front of me and tell me that he was God, but no, I would think I was just having a delusional vision. And so the moderator said, is there anything that would ever persuade you? He says, well, honestly, no, there's nothing that would ever persuade me. And he says, well, for a whole hour, you've been saying you have to base your belief on evidence. You seem unwilling to do that. Same thing has happened in my debates with younger creationists. I've been asked, what would it take for you to change your position? And I said, well, if I were to see the Bible clearly stating uh, that the universe and the earth were young and not old, uh, that would have a dramatic impact because I trust the Word of God. Or if I were to see scientific evidence uh, for a young earth or a young universe, even if I saw one piece of evidence, I said, you know, I haven't addressed the science, but I do have a talk on the science and a couple of debates I had with uh, Dwayne Gish, this is years ago, he's now passed away, John Morris, the uh, president of the Institute of Creation Research. It was a debate moderated by a lawyer. And at one point, the lawyer turned to both Dwayne Gish and uh, John Morris and said, can you name any scientists who, independent of a Bible interpretation, has acknowledged that there's any scientific evidence for a young universe, for a young Earth, even one piece of evidence. And both of them said, no, we can't name a single one. The lawyer turned to me and said, I don't need to know anything about the science. The fact that they can't come up with a single witness tells me there's no credibility. That's how it works in a court of law. If you can't come up with an expert to sustain your claim, then we know it has no credibility. And that's been true of every young earth creationist I've debated. They've all admitted they can't find a single scientist or engineer who says there's any uh, you know, evidence. It came up in the Supreme Court in 1987. Brought forward a bunch of scientists saying, you know, how credible is the young earth view based on pure science? And they said the credibility ranks no higher than the scientific credibility uh, that the earth is flat. And I can tell you as an astronomer, I can make a stronger case for a flat Earth than I can for a young Earth. So, either one is very good, uh, but you can actually make a stronger case for a flat Earth. So, but that means getting into all the science. And what I've learned with most young Earth creationist audiences, they don't want to listen to that. They only want to listen to the Bible, which is why I just focused on the Bible today. Uh, I do have on the flashcard I'm giving all of you my talk on the scientific part. So you can look at that, but I'm not going to give a lecture on that. Okay, go ahead. Um, so I just had, it's kind of close to a question I asked the other day, and I just want to build upon it. So I know we were talking about that God obviously has the ability to work outside the natural order. Yes, he can break sure. those laws because he's not bound by the same laws that we are. Um, that being said, though, um, I think it's important to recognize that because of that key fact, God, um, science cannot always prove everything God does because science, God's not bound by that. So in, in scripture, a good example of these are certain miracles he did that did break the natural order, that yes. were miracle accounts to authenticate him and his word. Um, and that being said, I feel like when we take that same premise and that same um, logic and apply that to the creation account, um, I think there's a lot, of, a lot of things that can fit here that I don't know always backs up by some of the evidence you were giving. So like, for example, I believe that God made the world, but God made the world in maturity. And maturity definitely um, can show age. 
So in other words, God isn't going to give us something that's not complete and not ready for being self-sufficient, not ready for um, really just be, be, being inhabited planet. So um, God is a God of completion. So when he would create the world, why would he not cre create it with the aspect of age? Okay, so let me stop you right there because sure. that's a very common objection that comes in these debates. Couldn't God simply create the universe and the earth to look old when in fact it's young? Okay, it tells us repeatedly that God is a being who can't lie or deceive. Sure. So if he were to create something uh, that is young, why would he make it artificially look old? And then it, the rebuttal to that is, well, didn't God create Adam with the appearance of age? And when Jesus transformed water into wine, didn't he make the wine appear old? No. When God created Adam, he created him full size because he wanted to communicate with him quickly. I mean, we've got a baby that's wandering around here. Okay? It's going to be about 18 months after birth before that baby can fully communicate. Because the brain is only one-third the size of an adult brain. But by God creating Adam with an adult-sized brain, Adam will be able to quickly become fluent. And God will be able to communicate. It's the question, does God create the chicken first or the egg? For mammals, it's always the uh, chicken. Because the egg can't take care of itself. Now. Does that mean that if we were to go to Adam after he was created, we would see evidence that he was 30 years of age? I would argue we would see evidence that he was brand new. No gray hair, no chipped teeth, no liver spots on the skin. Somebody here is only 17 years of age. If we were to actually look at you carefully with a microscope, we'd see all kinds of tiny liver spots all over your face. When you get to be my age, those spots get a lot bigger. Okay, That's something you can look forward to. Uh, but if you're brand new, there's no liver spots. If you're brand new, the cholesterol in your bloodstream is only 60 um, uh, you know, milliliters of, milligrams of, per liter. Uh, so I believe Adam had just that 60. He was brand new, but he was full size, fully functional. Likewise, the water was turned into wine. What did the wine steward say? This tastes like high quality wine. He didn't say it was old wine. And there's a distillery in Japan that makes whiskey that's brand new, that tastes just like 30-year-old scotch. So my whole point is, God never creates with appearance of age. And the real rebuttal to that is when we look at astronomy. When we look at astronomy, we see age that trans goes across 14 billion years. So some of the stars measure to be brand new, some of the stars measure to be thousands of years old, some of them millions, some of them tens of millions, some of them billions. And so, and again, the problem with God are creating with appearance of age, he's basically making a false picture of what he created. That's not the God that we see in the God of the Bible. Most younger creations accept that and say, we reject this doctrine of appearance of age, because they realize they fall in the trap of making God a deceiver. Sure, maybe the place I'm confused and maybe you can better explain to me is, like, for example, in the Garden of Eden, if, if we were to say that obviously God being outside of natural order, if he was creating it in, in a seven day period, and some, a botanist would go into the Garden of Eden and they would cut down a tree and they would count the rings to see how old it is, it would show the apparent appearance of age, even though God just created it. Well, let's take your proposition that we're only looking at thousands of years for the age of the earth. Sure. You've got a tree in the Garden of Eden, there'd be no tree rings in it at all. If you've got tree rings, that gives a false appearance of age. So if you saw tree rings there, you would say, okay. Uh, again, based on the principle, God does not create uh, with the appearance of age. And by the way, if you trust the tree ring data, you can go into a community near Riverside, California, you'll find a tree there with 14,000 rings in it, continuous rings. So that immediately takes you outside the 10,000 year limit of younger creationism. And we see that all over the place. Dendrochronology, actually, you know, for example, uh, the thing I noticed that disturbed my young earth creationist opponents the most in one debate is when I talked about the ice cores in Antarctica and in uh, Greenland. And, uh, they had no answer for it, because what you see in those tree rings, or those ice rings, 
They say, well, they're not annual. You get thousands of rings per year. I said, well, here's the problem. This ring has a dust signature of a Krakatoa volcanic eruption. This uh, layer, ice layer, has a dust signature of the Vesuvius eruption that took place during the days of Rome. We count the number of years between them. They're exactly what we see in the historical records. They really are annual layers. And in those annual layers, you can see the cycle of the variation in Earth's eccentricity and the cycle of variation in the tilt of Earth's rotation axis, which means if you're going to claim it's young Earth, you mean that the laws of Isaac Newton, the laws of gravity, are invalid. But the Bible tells us those laws are, in fact, intact. So or, they see that. Or God, and, or God wasn't within the laws of, you see what I'm saying? Or God worked outside. Yeah, but the here's the problem with that. God can work outside the laws of physics, but he doesn't have a giant eraser where he erases away the evidence of the miracle he performed. A good example of that, when God created the universe, he was definitely operating outside the laws of physics. That's when he created the laws of physics. But he left the evidence there for the astrophysicists to discover. So they, and that's what it tells us in Romans 1. Nature reveals God. It reveals his handiwork. It reveals his attributes. There's no giant eraser. And so if God performs a miracle, we're going to find evidence for the miracle. And that's what brought me to faith in Christ is looking at the record of nature and actually personally seeing the evidence is there that God performed these specific miracles. God wants to reveal God that wants to from us. And what's the time? Yeah, we're over at the lunch break. So, yeah, you can talk to me during lunch, but I need to let you go for lunch.